Hey everyone, this is an interview with the integral philosopher Ken Wilber on the trajectory of the last few years and on Jordan Peterson, which I'm releasing at the same time as a long article on Substack called What Happened to Jordan Peterson? So I've felt that there's been a significant change in his tone and content on Twitter and on YouTube in the last months. And I believe firmly that Ellen slash Elliot or whatever the hell her name or his name is, bears moral culpability for that. And I'm not taking down that tweet or acknowledging that my tweet violated the Twitter rules. Up yours, woke moralists. We'll see who cancels who. We're not really seeing the more thoughtful and accountable Peterson from 2018. Because I'm on guard so much, it's easier for me to get a bit snappy and and unpleasant, and that's bad. That's bad. I don't want to do that. I want to stay calm and detached and try to, you know, tell the truth and be happy that I'm there regardless of the circumstances. The problem is, is that because... The problem is I'm becoming too much on guard, and, and I, I've noticed a, a developing sense of impatience um, within me and some suspicion, and that's not good. I don't want to be in situations where those are my fundamental orientations. It's, it, it's, a, it's a sign of a certain amount of internal corruption on my part. I also argue that there's a significant split in his audience, a division between those who were captivated by a deep thinker on religion and mythology and those who wanted culture war clickbait. So check it out in the show notes below, sign up to our Substack, and I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ken Wilber. Ken, it's a huge pleasure to see you again. Great to see you, my friend. And how have you been? It's about three years since we met and there's been a pandemic, there's been an awful lot going on. Right. How are you doing? Quite well, thank you. Um, I just finished writing um, a big book. It's sort of a summary of integral theory, a bit of an overview and an introduction. And it's done in a fairly simple understandable way. So I like the way it's turned out. I call it making room for everything. It's going to be three to four hundred pages in manuscript form. Um, but it's still simple and easy to understand. So I feel good about that. I last interviewed you in 2019 and now you look slightly different. You've, you've got hair. Yeah, yeah, this is a wig. And I got it because um, I recently turned 73 years old. And I have, I started cutting my hair when I was in my mid 20s. And I did it primarily because I was practicing Zen Buddhism and sort of did it as an indication of my sincerity and my genuine belief in, in the practice that I was doing. And I have, on two or three occasions, let it start growing back in. But I never let it grow very far because it would irritate in my head. And I got so used to shaving every day. And so I never let it grow back in hardly at all. And so here I was, 73, it had been uh, basically 50 years, and I'd never let my hair grow back in. And I thought, well, hell, I'm going to finally grow my hair back in. And I started letting it grow back in, but I just couldn't stand the way it felt. And I'd keep shaving it off every morning. And I told somebody, I'm just never going to know what I look like with hair. And they said, well, get a wig. And I said, well, that sounds kind of stupid. But I went out and I bought two or three wigs and I just started wearing them just for the heck of it, just to see what it was like. And that's what I'm still doing now. I don't know exactly why, but I do look different than you would expect to see me. But I, it is curable. I, I can't take it off any time. And um, I'm back to shaved head, because so I still shave my head every morning. Um, so that's, yeah, if people notice some difference, that's what it is. And when we spoke last in 2019, we talked a bit about 
some of the big cultural figures at the time, so Jordan Peterson and the, the, the intellectual dark web phenomenon, which we talked about as a potential nascent integral conversation. Right. And it was a group of people who were reacting against what you might call the excesses of green, the right. excesses of postmodernism, and that was kind of the thing that drew them together. In that, and we talked about it as a nascent in, integral conversation because they were talking about things with nuance and in a in a kind of what felt like a more uh, in, a second tier way, uh, if you're familiar with the integral terminology. Um, my sense is that that um, cultural way. We, we called it a nascent conversation. It never really pushed on. And right. many, my sense of tracking the, the experience over the last um, three or four years is that many of them actually got pulled down into a, a mere reactivity against green rather right. than a second tier understanding, which was, yes, there are excesses of green, but there's also a positive side of green as well. And my feeling is that many of the figures within it lacked that kind of developmental understanding that there is a, a there there in right. terms of a second tier synthesis perspective. Right. Um, and many of them fell prey to, I think, um, reactivity, conspiracy thinking, audience capture for various reasons. Um, I wonder if you have had any reflections on that since kind of reflecting on our conversation three or four years ago. Yeah, well, the I think the key item in in this is the effect that things like the pandemic were having on the culture wars. And what we see, particularly with the culture wars, is that a lot of people were becoming caught up in green in a way that eventually caused them a lot of problems. Because what should have happened is that green should have continued to unfold and develop, and then people that were fully at green would start to transcend it and move into the integral stages of development. And we would actually see a tendency towards that in some thinkers, like a Jordan Peterson at his best, or um, a lot of people that we saw dropping out of green, like Dave Rubin. Um, and they would almost all define themselves publicly as being a classic liberal. And the classic liberal was started with an orange and then a green development. And they were ones that didn't buy mythic religions very much anymore. They moved more into rational and even pluralistic modes of thinking. Um, and the Classic liberals stressed individuality, and it stressed a small government structure, um, and it was post-mythic or trans-mythic, and it didn't believe in mythic religious forms very much anymore. And so those were a classic liberal. And they, the classic liberal state was a generally rational orange stage of development. And then when that continued its developmental cycle and moved into postmodernism or post-rational, that's when it got more into, there's not simply one correct way of looking at the world in an objective, rational, scientific way, or there's not one correct culture, but we have a multicultural diversity of various opinions and various cultures and so on. And that became a pluralistic viewpoint. And it is indeed a generally succeeding the rational stage of development we have. We move from this orange rational stage to this green 
postmodern multicultural stage of development. And that was, had a lot of positives, and it also got caught up in a lot of negatives. And what we started to see was the emergence of culture wars. And the, a lot of people in the post-rational, green, multicultural state, this is where we started to get a lot of the public statements involved in a culture war battle. And so um, when we think about how we make statements about the culture wars or what our beliefs are and so on, a lot of people got hung up in those ways of communication. And they got very sort of tired of it. And that's when we started to see a lot of the mature green multicultural thinkers start to move into integral stages of development. But those ended up not going very well. And a lot of people didn't make the transition into integral. And they, the ones that got caught up in multicultural culture war fashion. And they got so tired of being caught in that green, multiplistic worldview that a lot of them actually started regressing. They would just give up green and get so upset about it. And we, if we look at the percentage of people that moved on to higher stages, we find that about 25 to 28% of the population had moved into a green multicultural stage of development. But then the percentage that moved on to integral, when we get to the highest stage of integral, often known as turquoise, the percent of the population that reached turquoise was 0.5%, which is not very much, obviously, at all. And the rest of them tended to be either stuck at green or getting so upset that they would just give up green altogether and regress to earlier stages of development. Um, and that turned out being a real problem. Um, and we find um, a lot of the people that started at green and spoke out about it eventually started giving up on green, and they were the ones that defined themselves publicly as a classic liberal because they were moving back to, let's just take a rational approach to this and a scientific approach to this, and let's not get caught up in all these multiple interpretations and multicultural um, getting lost in our own thoughts. And so people from Dave Rubin to Jordan Peterson would, had publicly defined themselves as a classic liberal. Um, and that was um, what that should have indicated is that they were learning to integrate that rational, classic liberal stage of development with the green stage, and therefore ready to move on to truly integrative or synthesizing or integral stages of development. But those tended not to happen. And so the culture wars just sort of exploded. And that is what things like the pandemic on down tended to inflame. And that's sort of still where the culture is at. And we still don't have a very high percentage of people at integral stages of development. Um, 
and there are still a lot of people caught at green, and um, it's causing a lot of turmoil. And I think particularly a kind of internal turmoil that people get when they get stuck at this multicultural way of thinking. Um, and that's a real problem. And I see that um, infecting a large portion of social media and infecting a large portion of people in terms of their everyday orientations. And it's a real problem. And you mentioned, you mentioned Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin as examples of, you said they were fighting green so much that they regressed back. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about that. Yeah. And I think the argument that they would give probably is that the pathological green, the broken green was so toxic and so totalitarian in many areas like the media and academia that that was what needed to happen, that, that actually it just needed to be fought against. Um, so I'm interested in how you see that dynamic. Well, I, I think that's essentially correct. And whether they consciously thought it through in those ways, or if they just had an interior rebellion against all this green and sort of just tossed their hands up and ended up moving down a stage or two. Um, I think that's more likely. Um, but um, you can generally see it, I think, in somebody like, let's say, Dave Rubin, um, because he starts out where he's very much in favor of a green orientation and sort of goes through many of the positives of multiculturalism and, and postmodernism and so on. And then he eventually gets so caught up in the negative sides of that that he just kind of throws his hands up and ends up regressing to pre-green attitudes. And that often will take the look of moving from the sort of left-hand approach to the culture wars to moving more towards a right-hand um, and he'll, it, it'll appear that he's actually becoming sort of more conservative or even more Republican. And that's what he has essentially stated. Um, and so the Rubin report, for example, his hour long show, makes that pretty clear that he's very centrist to right oriented. And he spends most of his time attacking the postmodern left, the extreme far left. And he's just not happy with it and how it's gotten so caught up in all of its multiplistic postmodernist uh, pluralistic ways. And he's much more centrist or even rightist in his orientation. And I think that, in part, that's a good thing, because we do need to remember all of those pre-left stages of development, because they're all important. And they all need to be integrated for a truly integral stance and orientation. Um, so I think what I'm looking for, and we did sort of see some of those people that moved from left to center right. And you see this in black intellectuals as well. So Thomas Sowell and Larry Elder. Um, and you can see them also sort of move from a strong left disorientation to a center right orientation. And I think, in a sense, that was in part a good move 
because we did need to include those centrist and rightist orientations. Um, but in many cases, they sort of bypassed, even though you could see them wanting to move towards a more integrated position, they ended up not actually quite making that shift to an integral stage of left and right and, and integrating that. And so you could have a multicultural orientation, but you'd also have a classic liberal orientation. So you wouldn't get lost in this postmodern multiplistic mess. Um, and when you end up with only 0.5% of the population at truly integrated stages of development, you can see that that just hasn't gone forward to the extent that we would hope it would go forward. I mean, I'd hope at least to see 10, 15% of the population at those integrated stages of development. Um, and that just didn't happen. Um, so that, I think, it remains a genuine problem for our own development as human beings. Because we really do want to get into at least uh, 10 to 15 to 20 percent integrating left and right approaches. Um, and that's just not happened to the degree that we would like to see it happen. And so the culture wars are still culture wars. And they're still, in certain ways, increasing. Um, they're certainly not decreasing. It's not getting, oh, we're finding a little less of the culture war attitude, because we're not. Um, and that's a real problem. And I think it. Um, indicates a problem for humanity at large. Um, and my genuine hope and the general direction of development itself would indicate that we will be moving forward at some point. And uh, I think that would be great. And that's why um, I write books like Integral Psychology to point out that, that we really do. There is a there there. And that's what even people like Jordan Peterson just didn't quite get, even though you could see them wanting to move in that direction. Jordan Peterson is always doing things on how we integrate science and religion, for example. He's given dozens of videos on integrating science and religion. And he's very serious about it. He really wants to bring these different approaches together, but he's not quite making it in a way that really works. And so he keeps slipping down. Um, and I think that's a, a genuine problem. Yeah, and I look at someone like Jordan Peterson as the necessary revival and reintegration of traditionalism in a culture that had really lost touch with traditionalism. Right. And it, I still see it as a necessary, the phenomenon around him as a really necessary thing. And, but it also didn't lead to integration. So some people would look at him as um, making the culture wars worse. And in some ways, I think that's true that yeah. he did. And he definitely took sides. Like my, my biggest uh, concern with him having watched him is that at the beginning he was holding out a vision of a of a place beyond the culture wars. He said, this is what the left does well, this is what the right is for. And it was a very integrative framework. But I think over time he became, partly because he was attacked so much, and I think he was misrepresented a lot by the media, and he became more and more reactive and more and more a culture warrior taking one side yeah. rather than and, and it was an interesting thing to see. It did feel like a regression from a more synthesis right. perspective. And did you, do you feel the same way? Yeah, I think what you can see with Jordan Peterson is that because he started out 
with this essentially integral intent to bring together the left and the right, to bring together science and religion, to bring together modernism and postmodernism and traditionalism. He was one of the few people that in his videos, he would bring up the right traditionalist view. And he would always bring that up in his conversation. And so because of that, he tended to get identified with the either the alt-right or just the extreme right or just being a traditionalist, regressed, conservative in a way because he was always mentioning that side of the equation. And because he would get... People were sort of shocked to even hear the religious side of the equation because the most postmodern liberal rational thinkers just don't think of, about the truth to religion. It's just out of their minds. And when they'd hear him at least bring it up all the time as part of his overall view, they started to just think of him as being just this conservative, regressive thinker. And the more he sort of got identified that way, the more he actually started sort of emphasizing that side of the street. And so he certainly looked more and more conservative the more he talked. And I think he still had this integrative view in mind. But I think he did start to get sort of a conservative orientation. Um, and that was always made him interesting. But it was disconcerting to me to see him sort of always misinterpreted as being just an all right viewpoint. Um, so I think that's a bit unfair to what he was genuinely trying to do. Um, but it's, it's, it's understandable how that sort of happened. Um, and the same sort of express viewpoint could be seen in a lot of the people that were trying to integrate traditionalist with postmodernist views. So you sort of see that in Dave Rubin as well. And he, even though he formally identifies himself as a classic liberal, his statements are often not liberal, but conservative. And that's certainly the impression you get from the Rubin report. Um, and I think this has just been a sort of structural hazard of those people that are attempting to give integrated views in today's culture. And whenever you bring up the traditional religious side of things, you're thought to be just a conservative. And that's unfortunate. I, that's really unfortunate. But it's, it's sort of understandable. But it is the main structure of today's conversation. And I think the other factor is social media, that somehow the form of the platforms we're using and the, the way that we get so much negative feedback and positive feedback seems to be a catalyst to encourage us into more. Uh, it seems to be an, a radicalizing force in itself, that there is something about the way that these the conversation is framed and the way that we interact on social media where we get very quickly fans, supporters, encouraged, and it seems to be a polarizing thing. Like that for me is the other side of that uh, morality tale of the, the last four or five years of these figures is seeing how they also got warped because almost all of them were out of outside the institutions. So they were exposed to audience dynamics. They were exposed to, they realized that a lot of their, one, for one way or another, a lot of their audience were probably at more um, 
lower levels of development, we could say, uh, a sort of, and, and I think that was the other factor that, that seemed to accelerate that journey for many people. Yeah, um, the generally lower stages of development do tend to be the stages that contain truths that represent a conservative side of the argument. And you basically are a, a genuine conservative when you want to conserve what's already been presented. So you end up sort of at least, if you're including a conservative side of the argument, you're con including a traditional side of the argument. The traditional side means mythic, magic, archaic. And mythic means basically fundamentalist religion. And so you, when you present a conservative side of the street, you are presenting a religious orientation. But you're also trying to integrate that, if you have an integral approach, with the modern rational side of the street, which is progressive, evolutionary, liberal. And when you present a liberal side of the street, you're generally presenting a rational, orange, or green, pluralistic stage of development. So it's easy to see how when you are generally trying to integrate both of them, you are going to be including traditional religious components in addition to your modern scientific rational components. But because you're doing that, you can, well, among other things, it predisposes you to present a very conservative, regressive sort of religion. So even in somebody like Jordan Peterson, when you talk about religion, you're talking about what's presented in the Old Testament, or you're talking about a fundamentalist version of an ultimate reality that's an actual God thing, and that God thing looks over us and takes care of us and is responsible for our development and our evolution and all of that. Um, and that tends to be taken, if you're actually at a mythic stage of development, those are all taken as fundamentally true. They're a fundamentalist reality that is just not deniable. And that's very different from having a direct spiritual experience of the oneness of all reality, for example. And that's one of the problems, even with Jordan Peterson, is he tends to talk about God as this existing thing. And then when you hear him talk about, oh, ultimate states of consciousness or spiritual states of consciousness, then he'll get out of that and he'll talk about a direct experiential reality that can't be really discussed, and, and certainly not in fundamentalist mythic, mythological terminology, but as a direct experiential reality. And that's one of the problems when you take this integrative approach and you're including traditional stages and modern rational pluralistic stages. And so that can end up being a real problem. Um, and what happened with Jordan Peterson is because he talked about this sort of synthesizing integrative stage, and then he would talk not only about the modern rational stage, but he would talk about the traditional mythic stage of development. And because that was rarely expressed by modern liberal commentators, people started to remember him for that traditional fundamentalist approach. I, it's certainly what sort of subconsciously happened with me. And that's how I started to think of him basically in that way. But then I realized that that wasn't really what was going on, but that it was happening to a lot of people that had come from green, is when they really got stuck in the green, 
pluralistic muck, they started to just throw off green. And instead of throwing it off and moving to a higher stage, they just threw it off and tended to slide down to a previous stage. Um, or that previous stage would at least start to enter their awareness in a more forceful way. And so they would end up talking about it more often and more forcefully. So when you say get stuck in this green muck, do you mean when they're attacked for going against Green's values, or is that what you mean by that? It certainly can, um, because essentially what they did when they gave up on Green, on being stuck in Green, is they often went to just uh, the previous orange rational or amber mythic stage of development. Um, and when, of course, when they did that, they were attacked by green. Um, and I think it, at that point, um, then that would often be the criticism that they would get. Were you disappointed in what you saw from Jordan Peterson? Well, um, disappointed is slightly too strong a term. But not much. Um, there was a, a sort of letdown that he didn't pursue a true integral stage of understanding. Um, and I think in many cases, he really pushed into the beginning of the integral stages, particularly when he was doing his work on interpretation of the um, Genesis approach to the Bible and religion. And you could, you could see there that he wasn't giving just a mythic understanding or approach. And he wasn't specifically saying, here's a rational approach to the Bible, but he was talking in those terms. And he was attempting to integrate what he was saying rationally with a rational understanding of the early magic and mythic stages of the Bible. And so there was a true integrative approach that he was taking. And um, I wanted to see him just push into truly integral stages. But he never quite did that. Um, although, again, he, you could see that that was the direction that he was headed. And so, um, particularly as he got more and more truly alt-right oriented, um, then I saw him sort of talking less integral approaches. And that was a bit disappointing. And how did you see this change? Well, basically, uh, just his discussion about the traditional side of the argument, and that he would always emphasize that stage, uh, that side of his argument. And that was, uh, in a sense, it was fine when he was also trying to give a truly rational understanding of it. But as I say, as he sort of got identified for the wrong reasons with an alt-right stance, but then as over the years, two or three years, he sort of started really emphasizing that alt-right to the extent that he wasn't talking integrated terms as often, then that's what was noticeable to me. And that's why I was a little bit, as I say, disappointed in the direction that he seemed to be taking. Um, he could almost always snap back in to a rational slash mythic approach. But uh, I saw him sort of himself get kind of caught up with his all right identity. Because the fascinating thing for me back in 2017 with him was someone who was arguing for the reality of religion, for the reality of spiritual experience in a culture that for me as a journalist 
I had always seen very much defined by the new atheist perspective, right. which was hugely skeptical, very materialistic, broadly secular, and to see someone come through with that, with that, and the phenomenon that arose around him felt right. like a new opening to a, dis, a more complete discussion. Right. Uh, and that, I think, I'm interested where you see that dynamic now. Do you think there is a new openness to that dimension? Um, I'm not sure how much that approach has caught on because um, even though you can see to some degree a slight increase in center-ish thinking, um, I don't see as much as of a rational interpretation of the traditional mythic experience and understanding. So I don't that often hear somebody talking about spiritual experience or even a rational understanding of a religious approach. Um, and I think that the only time you tend to hear about something like a truly spiritual unity with the universe type of experience generally tends to be in discussions of psychedelics. And there is a general tendency of psychedelics to produce these mystical types of unity experiences. And that's been known since the 60s. And it's fairly widely accepted that that's what you'll get if you take a psychedelic. Um, but that's about the only place I really hear some true rational discussions about genuinely spiritual experiences. And by spiritual, I mean not only um, mythic religious type of fundamentalist discussions of spirituality, but this genuinely waking up or transcendental experience of true unity with the cosmos or oneness with everything. And those are very real experiences. They're not just mythic fundamentalist explanations of reality or experience. Um, and they're uh, fundamentally crucial type of experience for human beings is actually experiencing the oneness, your oneness with everything is a crucial, extremely important experience for human beings to have. And it represents, if there is such thing as an ultimate reality or an absolute truth, it, it really is an ultimate or absolute reality for us. And it's the ultimate ground of all being. And that's not a white-haired gentleman in the sky type of thing. That's a fundamental ground of all being. And that's a very, very real reality. And it's a very important. It's something that can't really rationally be directly known and approached. Because it's not just a rational existence. It's a true ultimate ground of all reality. And so that's not something that you simply sit around and think about. It's something you directly experience in a real and visceral and ultimate fashion. And it's a very important experience. And most of the world's great religions have some sort of mystical core. For example, all of Zen Buddhism is about having what they call a satori, which is a direct experiential awakening to your Buddha nature, your oneness with everything. And the whole point of Zen is to get a satori, get an awakening, get an enlightenment, get a feeling of oneness with everything. And the same is true in Vedanta Hinduism or in contemplative Taoism or in uh, mystical Christianity. It's the same thing. The cloud of unknowing is an experience of this trans-rational ground of all being, or it's Plato's light outside the cave of shadows. And it's a very real reality, and it's very important that we take up some sort of meditative or contemplative practice so that we'll drop our rational 
obsessive thinking and go into this direct experience of oneness with everything. And people can actually, it's an actual practice you can take up, and whether it's doing Zen meditation or Buddhist meditation or Vedanta meditation or meditation on some sort of Christian mystical approach, like actually going through the cloud of unknowing and reading it, studying it. Those are all very effective approaches for human beings to have this extraordinarily profound experience of oneness with everything. And how are you seeing the state of the US culture at the moment? So a lot of your integral looks at different cultural values, and right now it does feel like things are getting extremely heated in the US. Extremely. In terms heated heated hot oh hot um in the u.s with looks like roe versus wade might be overturned any moment potentially trump coming back to office in 2024 is the u.s seems poised in a very peculiar way from from the outside between these different value modes and the culture war is as as hot as it's ever been um i yeah i think basically it is and um, one of the ways you spot it is just the severity of the culture wars themselves. They seem to be very present and very noticeable. And you can see people moving across the spectrum from sort of mythic amber to orange, rational to green, pluralistic. And they seem to just move through the, that entire spectrum. And people that get into green tend to get tired of it sooner or later, just because it is a multiculturalism that can become fragmentary very easily in just looking at all the different cultural approaches and all the different um, ways of thinking about things and the different fragmentations that are going on, including the different culture wars. Um, and I think that is, in some ways, the culture war aspect especially has just gotten more intense. And um, we can see that it politically with expressions like Donald Trump, um, because he represents one side of the culture wars quite strongly, um, versus somebody like Hillary Clinton, or somebody who represents the leftist side quite severely. Um, but those kinds of battles, and the reason Trump would end up coming back is because these different factions are quite strong. And um, the culture wars are strong, and the different uh, factions in the culture wars are quite strong. And I see that as people have, they, they will bounce from green to orange to amber and sort of back and forth along that spectrum, but they haven't learned to bounce up to integral. And I think that that's just a result of the fact that we have generally developed to a green stage of multicultural understanding. And again, probably about 28% of the population has reached green stage. But only about seven, eight, nine percent have moved on to integral stages of development. Um, and I think that that is that the shift from orange rational stages of modern development to green multicultural postmodern stages of development, that was an important development. And as I say, it went from 1959, when only 3% of the population was at green, to 
1985 when over 15 percent of the population was at green, and it was moving to 25 percent to 28 percent at green. Um, and that was an important stage of development for us because it was multicultural and it did um, reach out to include a lot of different opinions and different approaches. Um, and all of that was a healthy stance. And then it tended to get stuck at those multicultural differentiations to the point that it actually started to fragment there in some ways. And that's when we started to see people from Dave Rubin to Jordan Peterson just sort of throw their hands up at Green and indeed talk about they were classic liberals. Because the one thing that Green transcended was a classic liberal individualistic approach to reality. And when they got tired of that, um, even though they were still capable of thinking from green, they often threw over that multicultural um, postmodernist way of thinking. And that's when um, they would openly start describing themselves as classic liberal. Um, and that was, I, in a sense, um, that was an understandable shift, but I think it was a very important shift as well. Um, and it's still kind of where we're stuck at today. Um, and so I'm still watching that one. And are you looking at the, the next 20 years or 50 years are you optimistic or pessimistic? Um, for 20 to 50 years, I'm optimistic. For the next 10 or 15 years, I'm not as optimistic. I'm not sure when that divide we've talked about that the culture wars creates, particularly the split between far left and far right. I'm not sure we're through that split. And I think it's a very profound split, and it is the basis of the culture wars. And um, I see it as a sort of necessary intermediate stage that we're going through. And so I think the beginning of the culture wars was fine. I mean, it was, it was an important shift we made. Um, but we're still stuck in those kinds of splits and differentiations and fragmentations. And I don't see that getting much better in the culture at large. Um, if anything, I see it slightly digging in. And so the fact that we could have people want Donald Trump and then throw him out and then pull him back in again, that's, to me, completely indicative of the split between the culture wars and what's going on. And I think we're going to continue to see that kind of, of development. And so it wouldn't surprise me to see Donald Trump actually get elected when he runs again. Um, and that's all indicative of this increasing divide that we are experiencing right now. And I don't think that's going to just go away. So I think 10 to 15 years we'll start to see it overcome to a major degree. And 20 to 50 years, I think just the very intrinsic nature of developmental unfolding itself will push us through that sort of broken green into integral stages of development. And I'm, I feel very optimistic that that will happen within 20 years, and certainly within something like 50 years. Are you, you're, you mentioned you, you turned 73 recently. Uh, uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned that you turned 73 right. recently. Are you starting to think about your legacy? What would you like your legacy to be? Um, I haven't thought about it that much. 
because I don't think about my age that much. Um, I mean, I don't particularly feel 73. I don't think about that a lot. I didn't think about it when I turned 73. Um, but, I mean, I have some ideas about my legacy and what I'd like to see it be. And what I would like to see it be is people looking at a way to think in integral ways. And that just means in ways that bring together all of the different forms of thinking and methodologies and experiences that we have, simply because all of them are available to human beings. And so if we're not including all of them when we think about a human being, we're not really thinking about a full human being. And there's something wrong with that approach. And so we want to, when we think about a human being, think about all the aspects of our self and our self-understanding and our self-awareness. And that does include, when we look at ourselves, we find these stages of unfolding that we all have available to us and how different philosophies, science, religions tend to be produced at these different stages of development. And one of the things that we want to do when we think about a full human being, is think about all the stages of growth and development we have. And this particularly includes the highest stages. And these right now mean integral stages that are like 10% to 0.5%. But there's at least two or three higher stages beyond that. I call them third tier. But they're very important stages of growth that we have available to us. And the major reason that most people don't develop to those stages is the same reason that most people get stuck at green, is that they just don't know that they've got a higher stage available to them. And they're not even looking for it. And so that is one of the main reasons that people get stuck at green. They just don't realize there's a yellow and turquoise stage of development beyond those. Um, and so that tends to be um, something that I think when people, one of the things I hear most often about people that first discover my work or read their first book or something like that, the, one of the comments I get most often about is, people are just really sort of thankful or almost grateful that they're aware of they have higher stages of growth and development available to them. And then when they look back at the early stages and they see the type of religion or philosophy or thought that those stages produced, like archaic or magic or mythic stages of development, they can remember what they felt like when they were at those early stages. And then they'll see that they're rational and pluralistic and integrated stages, and they can bring them all together. Um, and I, that is a that's always gratifying for me to hear that. Um, and that, I would hope, would be part of my legacy, was that here is a full, developed human being. And look at the various stages that they've gone through. And you can go through these stages as well. Um, because you really do see a bigger and more inclusive and fuller world as you go through these higher stages of development. They really are more embracing. And it's particularly when you make the jump from deficiency needs to being needs, from first tier to second tier, you can truly feel the expansion in your own self-awareness when that happens. And so I hope that would be part of my legacy, is pointing people to the fact that we do have these higher stages of development, and you have them as well, and so don't give up. Um, and then um, just reading the various ways that the different types of like 
I outline, for example, in the integral framework that I give, I outline what's called the four quadrants or the eight zones. And those eight zones each produce a very well-known and very widely studied different type of methodology. So what I call the upper left quadrants, they produce like introspection or meditative forms of awareness or even rational forms of awareness. And on the lower left, which is community understanding or interactive understanding, they produce methodologies like hermeneutics or how we actually interpret each other. And they produce ethnomethodology or studying the different types of behavior that different cultures engage in. And so all of these different zones have a different methodology. And to go through them is to recognize how familiar they are and how you've, yeah, I've heard about that, even if I don't know exactly all the details about it, I know what you're talking about when you mention something like hermeneutics or interpretation. Um, and to realize how all of these methodologies fit into a whole viewpoint. And they're all integrated, they all fit together, and they're all very important and we get very different types of understanding from each of them. And so that's an important part of the integral framework that I've given. And there's also different motivations that come from these different quadrants and different zones. Um, again, they all have a different philosophical orientation. Um, and that is also part of what I'd like to be my legacy for people looking at all of these different approaches and understanding how they all fit together. Because you mentioned the different levels and that people are aware of those different levels. One of the criticisms that some people make about integral is that when people discover that, they immediately place themselves at the top of the hierarchy right. and assume that they're more developed than they are, which can be a problem. Uh, it becomes a kind of one-upmanship or yeah. a a game of uh, status hierarchies. Yeah, that's true. And that's true for a lot of Western philosophers that have looked back at our history and see different stages of unfolding. So typically somebody like Hegel traces out all these stages of understanding. And of course, he's sitting at the very top of all those stages. Um, somebody like Gene Gepser traces these major stages of development. And of course, he's sitting on top. Um, it's very common that, first of all, if you are at one of those top levels of development, you will tend to see all the levels of development because that's just your mind makes room for them. And so, while it's almost true that everybody at a higher stage of development will see all of the previous stages of development, it's not true that all people are at the highest stage of development. So we do have to watch out for that. And one of the only ways that I deal with that is if somebody says, oh, I'm at turquoise, then I'll generally say, that's fine. You do realize there are at least three more stages to go. And the fact that I have written less on them means that they are probably not that aware of them. And so they can't automatically put themselves at the very highest. Um, and I'll often point that out just to get them out of there um, at the highest stage stuff. But it does tend to be an occupational hazard of learning any stage sequence, is you'll see that there all are these lower, earlier stages, and I've gone through those. I can actually remember that. And now I'm sort of at this intermediate stage, and I maybe don't recognize that yet. It's still the subject through which I'm looking at the world, and therefore it's not something that I see as an object. And so, but then there are usually a couple of stages higher than that, including 
um, green and yellow and a turquoise. And they'll often just automatically jump up to the turquoise. And um, because they can generally understand what I'm saying from an integrated stage. They'll simply assume that that's the stage that they're at. Um, and that is, well, it's true in 0.5% of the case. The, the other criticism that is made is that the whole idea of stage theory is colonialist and um, regressive. Right. Um, well, I would have thought that um, until I ran into the work of James Mark Baldwin and the over a hundred researchers that I gave the hundred developmental models from in integral psychology. And all of their approaches are based on empirical research. They actually look at people and ask them questions and follow their behavior and did other experimental approaches to see what stage they were at. And when they all started coming up with these essentially similar stages of development, like an archaic stage, um, a magic stage, and a magic stage is when you think in magical terms. And that means you think that if you alter a symbolic representation of something, you'll actually alter the thing it's representing. So if I um, simply think that I've changed something in the real world, then I'll think that there's a real change in the real world. And if I make a symbolic representation of that and I change the symbol, I'll think the real thing has actually changed. And that's what I think it's magically changed and that's where they get the term magic. And magic is a commonly used term, but it was first used by Gene Gepser in his major stages of development. And then the mythic stage is where I actually think about mythic symbols and mythic figures. So Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite, and things like that. Um, and much of the Bible is written in mythological language. And so the thought that something is simply true in mythology means it's true in the real world is a typical understanding of mythology and mythological thinking. Um, and then we move to rational, and rational actually thinks in rational terminology. Um, and by the way, when um, James Mark Baldwin retired, he taught at Harvard with his friend William James, and William James was studying states of consciousness, like religious experience, and James Mark Baldwin was studying structures or levels of consciousness. And so when James was writing the variety of religious experience, Mark Baldwin was writing thoughts and things or about structures of development. William James is talking about states of experiential unfolding. Um, and when Baldwin started his study of stages of development, he was the first one to actually discover that human thinking goes through these different stages of development. And when he retired from Harvard, he taught in Paris. And one of his, he had many students. And one was a young student from Switzerland named Jean Piaget. And Piaget got an enormous education from James Baldwin. And he, of course, started doing an enormous amount of research on infants. And Piaget's work became quite well known in the 1950s and 1960s. And it particularly changed our entire approach to education. Because what um, Piaget discovered is that these stages 
go through what he called um, pre-operational thinking to concrete operational thinking to formal operational thinking. And that was magic to mythic to rational stages of development. And we have a different way of thinking at each of these major stages. And when we get to rationality or reason, we tend to think in, in terms of rationality and logic and, and our typical ways of rationality or rational thinking. And then you can go on from that and you get from it taking a rational view to taking a post-rational or multiplistic view. And that's the postmodern multicultural stages of development. And that's a green and where you divide the world up into multiple ways or multiple, well, fragments in a sense but multiple fashions of looking at it. And then you can, so you get multiple systems, multiple cultures emerging. And you can see all these green differentiations or multicultural separations, but you can't see how they all fit together. You can't pull them all together into one unified view. But that happens when you get to the integral stage of development. And then you'll take all these multiple green fragments and you'll pull them together into unified systemic paradigms or wholes, whole approaches to reality. Um, and those are um, incredibly real. And they come from empirical research in development into these levels of development. And you can think about each level transcends and includes its predecessor. So all we're really seeing in these levels of development is increasingly large capacities in our own thinking. So we can integrate and envelope and include larger and larger segments of our reality into greater and greater holes until we get to integrated or integral holes, which at least today represent the highest stages of development that most human beings have some sort of access to, even though there are a few higher stages we start to transcend and include those in even larger types of holes. But that's for especially a future stage of unfolding. But all of the basic levels up to and including turquoise integral stages of development are all available to us and have been demonstrated to be available to us by direct research on real human beings. So these are real stages that really do unfold in a truly transcending and including fashion. So that's um, when I saw all of that evidence and I went through all of these different developmental models, whether it was Maslow or Lovinger or Keegan, um, Piaget, James Mark Baldwin, and I saw all of them drawing together essentially similar-ish types of levels, that became a very real reality for me because it was based on real research into real human beings. And these stages are real in pretty much every human being that's ever been studied. Your work has been hugely influential, very widespread in many different areas. Do you have any regrets or missed opportunities when you look back? Um, no, actually, I'm quite happy with how it's gone. And I frankly never would have guessed or thought that my work would be as widely accepted as it has been. Um, and I, because I, when I just went into it, I was just sort of studying it 
from my earliest understanding. And I wanted to express this growing integrative understanding that I was getting. And so I saw all these levels of consciousness as existing in the spectrum of development. And I called the first book I wrote when I was 23, I called it the spectrum of consciousness. And that's what it was about. Um, and fortunately, that book really took off. And it had an enormous uh, following. And uh, right after I wrote that, I wrote a book called No Boundary. And then I started expanding the areas of study that I'd look into. So I looked into anthropology and wrote a book called Up From Eden. And I looked into developmental psychology and the unfolding of these stages. And I wrote a book called The Outman Project. And just on and on through about, I don't know, 25, 30 books. Um, and about five to 10 books in the overall process, I started to really catch on. And they really started to take off in a way that was very surprising for me. Um, I, I, I'm not sure surprising is the right word, but I never would have guessed that it was happening. And so when it did happen, I was sort of gratified and happy. Um, I guess I wasn't surprised that it was happening because the part of me thought, well, this should happen. This is good stuff. It really makes sense. And so I was just delighted to see that it was catching on the way that it was. Um, but um, I guess I would say I'm surprised at how many books have I've done and how many of them have caught on. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and so I don't have any regrets at all. It's quite the opposite. And with the, the practices and the uh, institutions that were built around your work, do you think, do you have any regrets about the way that they went? Um, also, no. Um, I've been very happy to see how it's unfolded in education. Um, religion has been particularly, uh, I'm gratified over, because religions are usually taken to be so different from each other. So if you're even um, a Hindu, you're likely not a Buddhist, and you're certainly not a Christian. And if you're a Christian, you're not a Buddhist, and you're not a Hindu. But my whole point was that there's a core to all of them that are essentially similar. And it's this, this experience of unity consciousness, or experience of directly being one with the entire universe. And you can find direct examples of that in the mystics of virtually all of the world's 20 or 30 great religious movements. Um, so I was very happy to see that type of expansion occur. Um, in psychology, I was glad to see it catch on. Same in sociology. Um, so I, looking back, I didn't have any regrets on how this was unfolding or in the different disciplines it was catching on in. And I was very happy with all of those developments. And is there anything more you wanted to say before we conclude this conversation? Well, um, that I guess I would go back to the unity experience and just remind people, because most people don't know about this type of experience, or they certainly haven't practiced to themselves have it, but it is a very real experience, and you can directly experience this oneness with everything. Um, you can have a satori or a kensho or stepping out of the cave, and it's a very real, very, uh, it's a very satisfying experience in certain ways because you realize that you're experiencing this ground of all being. 
and that you are one with all of it. And that's a really profound realization. And Zen calls it your original face. And so it'll say in one of its koans, show me your original face, the face you had before your parents were born. And that doesn't mean that you exist in temporal time before your parents were born, and you go back and experience that period before they were born, and then you experience them being born. Your original face just means this ever-present, eternal, all-present state of awareness. And you can directly experience your original face. You can have a direct experiential realization of this unity with everything. And I highly recommend that, um, whether you take up Zen or Christian mysticism or Vedanta or Taoism, it doesn't really matter. At the core of each of those, you'll get a description of this ever-present, unity awareness and it's highly highly recommended Ken thank you so much for making time yeah.